Good morning, church. Great to see you. Happy Sunday. Woo, that was awesome. I hope you remember those words when we start talking about the Holy Spirit in just a minute and how he gives us our breath and he is the indwelling spirit that lives within us. I want to show you a picture of a book. It was written by a guy with a really cool name named Sky Jathani, and it's called The Divine Commodity. Not The Divine Comedy, but The Divine Commodity. And in this, he's sharing a trip that he and his dad took to India. It was, it was not long ago, and he was walking the streets of New Delhi, and a little boy approached him. And he described this little boy as, quote, skinny as a rail. He had no shoes or clothes except for tattered blue cutoffs. His legs were badly malformed. They were stiff and contorted backwards in on themselves. And because of his condition, the little boy could not walk on his feet, but now waddled along on his terribly calloused knees. And he made his way towards Sky and his dad, and he cried out, One rupee, please. One rupee. Please, sir, one rupee. Sky then describes what happened next, and his dad, who eventually heard the cries of the little boy. His dad turned around and said, Son, tell me what you want. How can I help you? And the little boy just very, very quietly said, One rupee, sir. One rupee. And then he motioned with his hand to his mouth. And then he bowed his head in deference to his father. Sky writes this, my dad smiled at first, and then he started laughing. Tell you what, why don't I just give you five rupees? The boy's submissive countenance suddenly changed. In an instant, he became angry, even defiant, and he yanked his hand back, and then he just glared at us. And then it dawned on Sky. Oh, no. He thinks my dad is joking. He thinks my dad is just making fun of him, having a laugh at his expense. After all, probably according to this poor boy, who in their right mind would give you five rupees when all you asked for was one? So the boy turned away, started shuffling away, mumbling curses under his breath. But my dad reached into his pocket. And when that little boy heard the jingling of coins, he stopped and he cautiously turned and looked over his shoulder. My father was there standing, holding out a five rupee coin. The stunned boy waddled back up, kind of unsure, and my dad placed the coin in his hand. The boy didn't move. He didn't say a word. He just sat there staring at the coin. Finally, we said our goodbyes. We passed him and proceeded down the street. A moment later, the shouting resumed. Except this time, the boy was yelling something else. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the rupee. God bless you. Thank you, sir. And he raced after us and wouldn't turn loose, but he wasn't asking for more money this time. This time, all the boy wanted to do was touch my father's feet. To them, this was the ultimate thank you, the ultimate posture of humility and gratitude. And then Sky writes this. He says, this got me thinking. I imagine, is this how God sees us? As desperate creatures in serious need of his help, but rather than asking God for what we truly need, rather than desiring what he is able and more than willing to give us, we always settle for lesser things. Wow, what a great story. That got me thinking. I wonder how many times we as Christians settle for far less than what our Heavenly Father is able and willing to bless us with. Today we're going to dive into Ephesians chapter 3. You can go ahead and pull it up if you want. Hold your place there. I want to set the context. I'm going to read starting from the ESV translation if you like to sync up with me. And as we look at Ephesians 3, I think we're going to see that just like this little boy, it is very easy for us to expect less from God than what he is so excited to give, what he's actually willing to share with us. This passage is Paul praying for the church. Don't miss that, okay? I'm going to give you a heads up, just let you off the hook. This passage is one of the most deep prayers, one of the most theologically rich passages of Scripture in all of the New Testament. It will go over somebody's head today, okay? Is it you? I hope not. I hope you'll catch it. But just know, I have read this verse, I can't even tell you how many times, and I've never seen it in the light I saw it this week. So it's okay if this kind of, you read this and it glosses over it, you think, well, I think I get it. I think I'm, but there is five blessings that Paul is praying, five specific blessings for each and every one of us. If we claim to follow Christ, they are for you. 
five blessings. See if you can pick out all five blessings. And if not, don't worry. We're going to take it verse by verse and walk through it. Starting in verse 14, Ephesians chapter 3, it says this. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow, that is so, so rich. And as usual, the MSG translation does not disappoint. Check it out for for an extra point of view here. My response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth, I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength, that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take in with all the followers of Jesus, the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love, reach out and experience the breadth, test its lengths, plumb the depths, remember that, we're coming back to that, plumb the depths. Rise to the heights, live full lives, full in the fullness of God. I love how many times the word full shows up in that last sentence. So before we go any further, let me ask, would you say you are living in the fullness of God? If not, you're in the right place. God has such a word for, did you catch the five specific blessings? If not, let's walk through them together. The first blessing is probably the one we need the most, if we're being honest, and that is spiritual power. The blessing of spiritual power. Let's just be honest. We live in a day and age where Christianity is not looked at with power. Some of us don't even know the authority that God has given us as his rightful sons and daughters. The power factor of the Christian faith has all but fallen by the wayside. I think it's largely just been ignored. Many, if not most people, if you're being honest, as you look around, are suffering from a weak, maybe even anemic faith. Think about this. Contrast that to what we see in the book of Acts. We read the book of Acts, all this incredible. If you're new to the faith, the book of Acts is the book recording the Apostles' Acts. It's often called the Acts of the Apostles. But really, it should probably be better called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit empowers them to do all these incredible things. They're they're just doing unbelievable amounts of miraculous things. And the power is flowing through them. The the church is moving forward with such authority and power. And I read this week of a pastor who shared a very open story. He vividly remembers sitting in seminary. He's in class and he's studying the book of Acts. And the professor comes up and he's explaining all these incredible ways that God is working in the book of Acts and how the apostles were out doing incredible things the days of the early church. The class was two semesters long, two semesters, three hours every week. And this pastor said it was his favorite class. He loved it. He would go and he would immerse himself in the book of Acts. He would study and memorize and research out on his off time and write these papers. But through all of his study, he said there was one nagging question that kept creeping in the back of his mind, and he would push it away because he didn't like the question. But over these two semesters, it kept coming back, and it was just haunting him, nagging in the back corners of his mind, thinking, if God could do such wonderful things to his people back then, why not now? Why aren't we seeing Well, sure, there's a million reasons. There's some excuses people could throw out. But guys, when we read the Bible, there is no verse in the Bible to suggest that God has quit working. God didn't get tired. He's like, Holy Spirit, go do your thing. And whoo, you tired? Come on back. Come on. Let's just, you know, we'll just, we'll wing it from here on out. You know, those people in 2021, they're going to be so godly anyway. They're going to be awesome. It's just going to be a great year. Let's just chill. Gabriel, Michael, more cornhole, right? No, there is nothing in scripture that's Y'all, I wonder if the fault's not God's. The fault is his people, his followers. We read about the power being used mightily in the book of Acts, yet I I look around and I wonder why we seldom see that kind of power on display. 
Could it be that we honestly don't expect it? Or maybe we're new to the faith and we don't really know about it? Or worse, maybe we've grown cold to it. We just don't even think God's going to, we don't even care. But the same power that was available to the early church is still available to us today. It's the same Holy Spirit. Paul just prayed this. He says, I pray that you will be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Do you sense that? The strength, the might of the Holy Spirit, this inner being, this is the highest need of every Christian today. This is the secret of our authority, of our influence for the Lord. He is ready to give this, especially if you're tired, especially if you're faint. Y'all remember those great words in Isaiah where he clearly points out he gives power to the faint? To those who have no might, he increases strength. There it is. Even the youth will fall and grow weary. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. That spiritual power that God promises in the Old Testament and the New Testament is available to us right here, right now, today. The question is, will you open yourself to it? And that leads to the second blessing Paul's talking about. His second promise is an indwelling presence. If you're taking notes, that's your second one, an indwelling presence. And Paul words it like this. Keep reading. He says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I think with all the craziness in this world today, this is the one we need to cling to. There are so many people, the enemy throwing all kinds of stuff at us. And we're running around this spiritual race and it feels so lonely. Sometimes we feel like we're the only ones trying to take a stand, don't we? And you look around and you think, gosh, is the Lord going to come back today because all I see is wickedness being rewarded? All I see is unfaithfulness. All I see is people being so angry and bitter and petty and gossipy and malicious. And we wonder why the world doesn't want what we have when what we have is not revealing Christ. But we have the presence of God himself within us. As a result of our faith in him, we are never alone. So if by faith you're here or you're listening online, and the Spirit does dwell in you, then the Spirit is supposed to show us things that the world will never see. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ. We're supposed to be different than the world. We're supposed to stand out. We're supposed to look at the world and go, I don't think that's right. In love, let me share with you a better truth. How are you doing with that? Is your heavenly viewpoint outweighing the culture? Because we're supposed to have the spiritual eyes from the Lord. This indwelling is promised. If you have surrendered to the Lordship of Christ and you have placed your faith in him, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So think of it this way. There will never be a time in your life, whether you're going through tragedy or joy or grief or the highest heights, that you're alone. There will never be a time. He has promised an ongoing indwelling presence that will never leave you, never forsake you. Next we see, if you keep reading, the blessing of a stable character. We have this stability of character. Paul writes it like this. The third promise is that you being rooted and grounded in love. Man, I love that. Think about roots for a minute. If you're able to dig up an old tree or a bush, then you know you've seen the root ball. You've seen that over time they go down deep and they get deeper and deeper into the earth and they draw nourishment from the soil. And if you leave them long enough, they become super stable, and then you have a hard time pulling it out of the ground. Most of us could pull up a, a young oak tree that's only grown for a few weeks, but go up to an oak tree that's been there for 20 years. Wrap your arms around it and try to pull it out of the ground. <laughs> right? Good luck with that. This just happened at our house. Do you all know we moved to Holly Springs? When we moved in, that backyard was landscaped, and it had mulch everywhere, and these trees that I can't identify, and like bushes that had thorns on, I guess the roses, they hurt, and they're really pretty, and it was like, I mean, it was like, it was awesome, right? It was landscaped, it was so pretty, and I'm like, man, that's going to be fun to keep looking that way, because I'm not a gardener, y'all know that. I will kill a bush, no time flat. So around April, I'm like, oh, there's a couple weeds, so I'll just pull that out. Then something happened. It, don't laugh yet. It got hot, real hot, like July hot. And I saw these weeds just start popping up. I'm like, man, somebody needs to do something about that. <laughs> somebody needs to get on that. Milo? Anybody? No? Me? I don't know. I don't know whose responsibility it was. <laughs> then August happened, and some rains came, and those weeds tripled. Y'all, they went from this to their weed. I kid you not. Taller than Milo, taller than Merritt. They are this tall. Some of them are now trees. Right? I have a picture. I'm saying it's on my phone. Come up after church. I will show you this picture. 
They are so big that I actually went up. I'm like, I got, this is embarrassing. Our neighbors can see them over the fence now, okay? That's when the shame factor is great. So I go and I grab this weed to try to pull it and it doesn't come. I'm like, are you kidding me? And I take two hands and I'm yanking. I'm like, all right, I got to get a backhoe or something in here because that ain't coming. Those roots have grown deep. I waited too long. Those weeds in three months became so deep in the soil, I literally cannot yank them out even if I wanted to. Paul talks about this in Colossians 2.7. He says, I want you to be rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. How is your character? See, we read stability of character. When the bad times come, we're supposed to be the ones that don't run around with our hair on fire. We're supposed to be the ones radiating the peace of the prince of peace. So you know I got to ask. Don't hate me. How are you doing with that? Because we're the ones who are supposed to be children of peace. We're the ones who are supposed to know this and have this stability of character. Our roots are supposed to have grown so far down into the ground that now the fruitful soil of God's love has given us upward growth, building character and fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. We're supposed to be showing these. We're supposed to be doing everything motivated and rooted in love. Just take the last week. Take a mental evaluation. Just pause. You don't have to say a word out loud. How did you do with that? Did you move, act, and breathe, and react in love this week? Some of you did. That's awesome. Some of you maybe got some room to grow, and that's okay. We're all in this together. There is room to grow. Next, we see this, the blessing of increased comprehension. Increased comprehension. The fourth promise is written like this. That you may have strength to, there it is, comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Almost seems like an oxymoron. How can I know something that is so great it surpasses knowledge? This verse is so deep. I like how it's written because honestly, it would take the comprehension of all the saints in every age to find out the breadth, the length, the height, the depth of the love that Christ has for us. Which is why, in the same sentence, it's described as a love that surpasses knowledge. Romans 8.35 asks this question. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, pandemic, distress, persecution, famine, sword, danger? The answer is nothing. Good luck trying to grasp and fully measure the magnitude and the depth that the love of Christ has loved us with. So let's ask this. Let's think about depth here. Has anyone ever been scuba diving? Just raise your hand. Any scuba diver? Yeah, yeah, one, two, three. Anybody ever done free diving without scuba deer? See how deep you can go? What's the deepest you've been if you've been scuba diving? 10 feet? 12 feet? When I was getting, yeah, about that. When I was getting my scuba certification at Sanford, we went into this Olympic pool, and I think it was 15 feet deep, and you had to go down and pick some stuff up, sit down there. Y'all, it was killing me. It felt like there were knives in my ears because my ears are so messed up, I can't equalize them. And so I'm like, I can't do this. I'm like, I got I to gotta surf it. The pressure was so incredible on my ears. The deepest I could go was 12 feet, right? When I think of the depth of Christ's love, I always picture the deepest ocean I can think of, the Marianas Trench. Y'all remember this? Just to put this in perspective, this right here is where the Titanic rests at the bottom of the ocean. This is like 12,000 feet down, okay? What's that? Three, three miles? About three miles. Think about this, double. That's the height of Mount Everest. There's the, tall, the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. That little thing right there. Here's the deepest hole we've ever been able to dig, 12, 12 kilometers. Here's the Marianas Trench. It is so deep that the pressure there is absolutely crushing. For us to go down and, and photograph, and maybe we're going to a recovery site and we're exploring, you have to have steel bulkheads that are reinforced. You have to have all these armor-plated things all over so that you can withstand the pressure of the ocean. We talked about this on Wednesday night just two weeks ago. Whether you're exploring or locating a site of rescue, it is not a surprise that the pressure at these depths is tremendous. Some of them are over 4,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. Now, you know me. Every time I think about this, I have to relate this to something in a movie. <laughs> and the greatest movie of all time, of course, is Star Wars. But a close second is Rocky IV. Right? See, y'all are spiritual. You get this? Yes. And 
So y'all remember this scene where the great Ivan Drago is here and the Russian premier is talking and he's doing this press conference and he's trying to demonstrate the pressure that this guy throws his punch, all right? So Drago's standing there, he's like, I must break you. And the Russian premier is over here, I give you Ivan Drago. He is the most incredible specimen. He, no one can match his strength, his endurance. Right? It's pretty good Russian, pretty good, right? A little bit like Count Chocula, right? It's... And he's sitting there and he says, whatever... Whatever he touches, he destroys. And people don't believe it. He says, let me show you. The average professional boxer punches 850 pounds per square inch. Ivan, take it away. And he lets Ivan Drago punch this meter, and the score comes up. And the first punch was like 1850, over 1,000 pounds greater pressure. Then he punches it again. His veins are popping out. It's, it's like, oh, it's just incredible. I'm like, yeah, I want to go exercise. And he's punching this, and it's like 2,100 pounds. Punches it again, it's like 2,300 pounds. And even like people are like, ooh, wow, and they're taking notes, right? That kind of pressure is this, is this, I'm just weird, but this is what I think of. Here was the shocking thing when they were down at these depths. The researchers saw fish swimming right next to their steel reinforced machines. And someone said, whoa, 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 where's their armor? How come they are not crushed? They don't have anything. They look close. They were normal fish. They had just a tiny fraction of an inch of skin. And they said, how is it possible these fish survive under all this pressure? How come they're not crushed by the weight of this water? And here's your truth grenade for today. These fish have a secret. The secret is they all have the exact same pressure inside themselves as they do on the outside. They have survival under pressure. 1 John 4.4 4 tells us, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Greater is the spirit within us, y'all, that the world can take away. There is nothing out there. We survive under pressure this world because the Holy Spirit has dwelled within us. We have increased comprehension of him. Jesus has poured his spirit into our hearts. The depth of his love is so far greater than the deepest depth we can think of. We don't even wrap our heads around it. Think of that. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The answer is nothing, nobody, no how, no time, can't stop, won't stop, till we drop past the Tylenol. He loves you. We remain in God's love, which leads us to the best part, the final blessing today. If you're taking notes, this is supposed to lead to complete satisfaction. Oh, yes, the good part. Complete satisfaction. Here's the fifth promise. I pray that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Complete and total satisfaction. Summed up in one word, fullness. Fullness. When I think of fullness, I think of Thanksgiving feast. If I don't relate it to a movie, I'm going to relate it to food. Do you remember as a kid on Thanksgiving Day how you felt? Man, and how hungry you were and how excited you were when you finally got to come up to that table and there was that food and all that amazing stuff. But you were too young to really be much help in the kitchen preparing the food. But you could see it. And you could smell it. And you could almost just taste those crescent rolls bacon and those marshmallows on them sweet potatoes. And that turkey and that stuffing and the pumpkin pie. And so you sneak into the kitchen thinking maybe, just maybe, mom's not looking. And I could swipe a crescent roll. And as soon as you reach, it's like a pow. No. <laughs> Not yet. Come back later. I want some. No. We're working hard, trying to keep that dog from doing the same thing you're doing. Get out. Take him. Go play football with your brothers. So you go and you play football with your brothers. And it's miserable because they're older and they're mean. And they never throw you the ball. They never hand it off, even though you're faster than them. And they tackle you, and you're wearing this terry cloth 1979 zip-up thing. And when they tackle you, the zipper goes inside and it knocks two of your baby teeth out. And you wake up, and you're bleeding, and they're freaked out. And this, sorry, just a little flashback there. Is that any, anybody else have that experience? So you go back in, you wipe off the blood, and you're like, is it time to eat? And you got the gaps where your baby teeth used to be, and you're so hungry. And they say, now it's time. And you come, and you sit down. And you return thanks. And when you say amen, you attack that food like a velociraptor on speed. And you are so fired up. And you don't even breathe or look up for 23 minutes. Doesn't even matter who's at your table, right? You're so fired up. The time you do look up, you take a sip a little apple cider. And then you dive back in because it's round two, baby. 
And if you play your cards right, you can go back up and sneak round three. And you come back and you sit down and you are just, just so stinking stuffed. But eventually, it happens. And y'all know what I'm talking about. That internal buzzer goes off and it says, uh, please tell your brain, stop, no mo, stop, you are full. But you have made a colossal, colossal mistake. You forgot about Mamaw's dessert. And Mamaw comes around with that pumpkin pudding, that bread pudding and those pumpkin pies. And you were sitting there going, how could I be so foolish? I wanted to eat 14 helpings of that banana pudding and 17 slices of that pumpkin pie because it had ice cream on it and whipped cream and all your dreams of eating all that, just like, oh, no, no. And then Grandma asks you, do you want some of the dessert anyway? And without even thinking, you're so mystified, the words come out of your mouth. You say, no, thank you. I'm full. And everybody's shocked, including Mamaw. You're what? I am 100% satisfied. In fact, I'm not feeling so good. And I'm going to take this turkey leg, and I'm just going to go to the sofa, and I'm going to pass out in a food coma, and I'm going to guard it. If you look close, the wife's coming to stake it back because you're about to roll over on it. But in this moment, life is so good. You are experiencing fullness. Do we live our lives walking and basking in that level of satisfaction with God? Because it's available to you. We have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The one who grants us peace and satisfaction with God. It's at our disposal. And maybe it's time to embrace it. Let me show you what I mean. In fact, we'll end a, a little bit early. I'm going to call the band up. And I want you to hear a, just a, a brief story about Fred and Cheryl, who were a mom and dad. And they were summoned to go to Haiti several years ago on an emergency pickup of a child who had just been orphaned. So they fly down to Haiti, they're landing on the tarmac, and they've, they've heard the horrible story that little Addie, who just turned five years old, her parents were tragically killed in a traffic accident. And this couple was a great godly couple, they were in line for this, and so they dropped everything, and they flew down, there was absolutely no family left alive for Addie, and they're crossing the tarmac to board the plane, and the little girl comes out, sees them, turns around with them between the mom and dad without asking, slides her hands up into the hands of her new mother and father. And the mom and dad, as they were writing this book, said, that was the birth moment for us. What's a birth moment? He said, this had the same emotional impact on us as the day our two sons, Thatcher and Graham, were born, 13 and 15 years ago. They're now teenage boys. And when they slid their hands up inside ours, we knew this was it. Here is this innocent, fearless trust being expressed in this physical act by a five-year-old girl named Addie, whom they just met. So the plane comes, and it lands in Arizona, their future home. They get off the plane, they take the car, they go back to the house, and they are sitting down, and they are having their first supper together as a family of five. So you've got Thatcher, 15, you've got Graham, 13, and then you've got little Addie, who's five years old. And they sit down, they return thanks, and Addie's eyes are huge because she's looking at a table with food she's never seen before. There's bread with honey butter, there's salad, there's plate after plate of pork chops. She's never even thought of eating pork chops. There's bowls heaping with mashed potatoes with melted butter on top, all these things. Addie had never seen so much food, and her eyes were so big as she watched her new brothers, Thatcher and Graham, absolutely savage that food. And they started eating it, taking it. She's like, what is happening? And they started taking more, emptying. Their teenage appetites absolutely taking over. And then the mom and dad looked across the table at little Addie, and they knew something was wrong. Little Addie's eyes no longer were wide, but they looked down at her plate, and she became so quiet and still. Mom and dad were like, what is, what is, is it, is it agitation? Is it bewilderment? Is it insecurity? And then the mom guessed. She said, you know what? I bet it's all this food disappearing in front of her. I bet she thinks because Addie grew up hungry and once the food's gone from the table, she thinks it's going to be another day, maybe two, before she ever eats again. And she just watched her two brothers take all the food, multiple pork chops, bowl after bowl of mashed potatoes, all of this. And she's thinking, that's it. And the mom looked at Addie and they talked and she was right. She took Addie's hand 
She led her into the kitchen to the bread bin. She opened the drawer and said, Addie, look, there's not one, not two, but three full loaves of bread for you anytime. Addie nodded. She shut the bin. She took her over to the fridge. She opened the door. She said, here is a full gallon of milk for you anytime. Here's a gallon of orange juice. Over here, we have fresh vegetables, jars with jelly and jams. Here's a carton of a dozen eggs. Here's a package of bacon. Then she closes it. She takes it to the pantry. There's bins of potatoes and onions and squash and row after row of canned goods. And she's handing them to her saying, feel this. This is yours. This is yours now. You are part of this family. She takes her over and she says, here's pickles, here's peaches, here's jars, here's peanut butter. If you want to make your own sandwich, let's go to the freezer. She goes to the freezer, opens it up, and Addie sees four giant frozen chickens, packages of fish just waiting, and two half-gallon cartons of ice cream. And this whole time, she's assuring Addie, Addie, there is so much food in this house. No matter how much Thatcher and Graham eat, no matter how fast they eat it, there's plenty more where this came from. Then the mom got down on her knees and she looked Addie in the eyes and she says, Addie, hear me. You will never go hungry again. It registered. You know why? Because the mom didn't just tell her. The mom showed her. She took her. She let her hold the milk. She let her hold the food. She let her see it. She said, it is enough. Food is there. Whether you believe it or not, your brothers are no longer rivals at the table. Addie, you are home. You will never go hungry again. And like this little girl, I think so many Christians go through life wondering, will God always be there? Will he always come through? Does he always keep his promises? Because we just read five incredible promises that tell us no matter how much we need, no matter how much we eat, his pantry never empties. He continually has more. There will never come a time when we are not filled with the fullness of God. Look at these five promises one more time. The blessings that are ours. In his word, he promises the blessing of spiritual power. Do you claim that? An indwelling presence, the Holy Spirit, which will lead to stability of character. Goodness, we need that more than ever. We need an increased comprehension how awesome he is, the width, the depth, the height, the love he has for us, which will lead to complete satisfaction. I hope you know the Savior. I hope you do, because it's life-changing. It's not a cerebral thing. It's not a feeling. It's the real deal. And it leads to the only source of complete satisfaction. We're going to open the altar in just a minute. We're going to pray. We're going to sing one last song. If you're a guest, It's the highlight of our day because we can just meet with God. No one will bother you if you just want to make this an altar and pray. Maybe you want to trust God to come through in new ways and you want to embrace these five promises. Do that. Maybe you just want to stand and worship God where you are as we sing the last song. Whatever God's leading you to do, be obedient. Would you pray with me? God, in these next moments, would you touch our hearts? Speak to us. We claim your promises. We believe your word. Help us to walk and experience the fullness of your love. And may we share that with others. God, put somebody on our heart today that we need to lay before your throne. May we not keep the good news to ourselves. May we look outward. May we share this truth. In Jesus' name, amen.